Um, my name is my name is Steve Sarah, and I'm a Wash and Infection Prevention Advisor on the USAID Momentum Country and Global Leadership Project. I'm going to be presenting today with my colleagues Lillian Tumaherwe, who is our Uganda Program Manager, and Sam Angam, who's our Uganda Monitoring and Evaluation and Learning Advisor in Uganda. Before we get started, I wanted to um, pass it to Jesse Shapiro, who's the USAID Environmental Health Team Lead, WASH Advisor, and uh, Sanitation Focal Point for some opening remarks. Thanks so much, Steve. And uh, on behalf of USAID, welcome to everyone as well. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to join the webinar this morning. I don't think we have to probably convince anyone on this call that WASH and IPC uh, is really important in healthcare facilities. But in the countries where we work, low middle income countries, half or maybe less of those facilities often have water available, sanitation facilities, hand washing, um, solid waste, proper solid waste collection, and, and regular cleaning. And if we think about the in terms of the COVID pandemic as well, it's hard to imagine, almost shocking that you would have to go to a facility to seek treatment and you may not be able to do some of these basic things to protect yourself and the staff there as well, protect themselves like washing their hands. But unfortunately, it's somewhat of a re reality um, in a lot of places. USAID has prioritized this issue for a number of years and, and tried to contribute to the global response and and challenge and improving this with uh, our partners in country. And we have a number of programs that do this um, and have been trying to say, do research in this area and learn about the best tools and approaches to, to help countries and facilities uh, improve the wash and in, uh, infection prevention and control uh, in the facilities. Um, one of those programs has been our uh, momentum program and its previous iter iterations as well as some other programs. And we've really developed some really interesting uh, and um, useful tools and approaches um, and tried to understand how effective they are, how efficient they are um, at delivering sustain, sustained change in these facilities. And some of the results have been impressive. We've also uncovered a lot of additional challenges and learnings. But when... Uh, when the COVID pandemic kicked off, uh, the USAID got a lot of supplemental funding from Congress to do some emergency activities in response to COVID. And a lot of that, those funds went out to WASH and IPC related things. We did a lot of risk communication programs, um, some really emergency response of providing like hand washing stations and, and, and simple things like that, some training. But we also wanted to see what could what could we take from our, our longer term development approaches, these ones that are maybe be providing more sustainable support um, to healthcare facilities for more long term and more comprehensive changes? And, and what could we apply those and what could we learn about them um, in a time like a COVID and pandemic when huge numbers of people are trying to go get um, services at healthcare facilities, supply chains are non-functioning, people are not traveling well, and there's a lot of people sick. And so we did kind of dig in the sofa cushions a little bit to try to come up with some funds. Um, and we asked uh, our partner, uh, Japayago and Save the Children through the Momentum program, what could we do about this if we came up with a little bit of money? And we were able to come up with this money and that's what, uh, help fund this program. And I think what we're gonna see today is really gonna reinforce and surprise us about what is possible with limited funding in a limited manner and in a really, really challenging context that we can still deliver some substantial improvements um, together with our partners uh, to really improve WASH and IPC. Now, these are in the uh, vein or vision of our, of our more development uh, aimed programs. We're looking at like small incremental changes. We're not looking at building any big infrastructure necessarily, but small repairs, really quick uh, and improvements, really focused on participatory assessment and action planning. 
And, and again, I think we're really surprised and happy um, to see the amazing progress that can be made. And I think with all of you, we really look forward to partnering more in the future and continuing these programs, learning more uh, and trying to expand them uh, across areas that need them the most. So with that, again, I'll just thank you on behalf of USAID and really look forward to the, the, the information that's gonna be shared now. So back over to you, Steve. Uh, thanks. thanks, Jesse, much appreciated. Um, next slide, please. So um, just to run through the agenda for today, I'm gonna to give a very brief overview of the context, size and scope of the five country program. Then I'll pass it to Lillian, who will talk in more detail about the two-phase strategic approach that we implemented. And she'll also uh, share with us a short video of how we were working with local partners like Christian health associations in some of the countries. And then Sam is gonna run through some of the highlighted cross-country results and do a, a short deep dive into an extended work plan we did in Uganda focused on sustainability with the Ministry of Health. And then I'll come back and highlight a few of the cross-country lessons learned and recommendations, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. Um, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to post them. We're collecting them and we'll try to consolidate them and respond as quickly as possible. We have represent, representatives from most of our country teams on the line, so we should be able to steer them to the right person. And with that, I will dive in. Next slide. Um, so as a brief overview, the objective of this five, five country work plan was to rapidly improve healthcare facility infection prevention readiness and wash services in order to protect the, their ability to deliver uh, essential RMNCH services throughout the pandemic. Um, we implemented this in 199 health facilities in five countries, um, but around 50 of those health facilities were added in a second cohort in India and Uganda. So you may not see them in the uh, results that Sam presents because we are just presenting on those that went through the entire life cycle of the program, which was 152 facilities. Um, most of the countries implemented a one-year work plan in Uganda, we extended for nine months based on a request from the Ministry of Health for more support. And we worked with uh, Christian health associations in Sierra Leone and Ghana and UPMB in Uganda to do this work. And we also got some technical support along the way from MWater. Um, the two strategic approaches that we implemented were uh, first to focus on strengthening health facility infection prevention readiness through support to infrastructure repairs, uh, supplies and equipment procurements and distributions. And that was a very short uh, phase, just a few months. And then we moved into a second phase, which was focused more on establishing and providing quality improvement and capacity, strengthening support to district health management teams and health facility staff to make further improvements and maintain these infection prevention systems. Next slide. Um, a little bit more context on the types of facilities we were working in. They were mainly in public facilities, but there were also a good number of faith-based facilities and some private. And we were working primarily at um, secondary and primary health facility levels, although there were a few tertiary facilities in some of the countries that we worked with. And next slide. With that, I will pass it to Lillian so she can share with you more detail on the two-phased implementation approach that we took for these uh, country work plans. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to say that Momentum Country and Global Leadership Project was implemented in two phases, which I'll highlight. Next slide, please. We had phase one, which you referred to as a rapid phase, Basically, phase one supported infection prevention readiness in healthcare at healthcare facility level. And the interventions we looked at, we looked at uh, limited infrastructure innovations, 
support to the healthcare facilities to improve access to water sanitation hygiene waste management in a subset of healthcare facilities that was at 48 percent of the healthcare facilities and uh, we looked at distribution and actually did that to all the healthcare facilities that were supported under momentum we distributed essential essential infection prevention control supplies and protective equipment including uh, masks, aprons, we had soap for cleaning, gloves and the like, which uh, helped in uh, especially the infection prevention and control in the facilities. Momentum also published uh, essential supplies list for infection prevention and control for healthcare facilities, for reference of healthcare facilities, local governments in, to inform procurement, to inform uh, distribution of resources to facilities. And the technical team on the program thought that those were rapid responses that could assist facilities to run fast to change their readiness scores in their facilities. Next slide, please. So when the first, in the, during the first phase, before we actually did all that, we had readiness scoring systems that we implemented in our facilities across all our countries. And these scoring systems looked at these domains that you look at here from COVID-19 screening up to healthcare policy and strategies. How ready was the healthcare facility to support the infection prevention and their control mechanisms of the healthcare facility here were reviewed. And those are the domains we're looking at depending on the WHO, uh, JMP and IFCAF and the recent COVID-19 guidance. So that was the scoring we did, which informed implementation. Next slide, please. So during the phase one, we had to monitor and see actually if there, were, if there was any progress in these facilities. So we looked at general change in the healthcare uh, score in the facility scores in view of infection prevention. We looked at changes even in specific wards like outpatient, labor and delivery postnatal wards. So we're monitoring these scores in the facilities, especially every month to see if there were any changes that were happening to inform our progress. Next slide, please. So we used a system of data collection and use that was Solistice application for data collection and use. We used Solestice because we're having a few challenges in the facilities and in countries, especially we looked at the existing national HMIS, the data collection tools for IPC. Most of them had very little indicators on IPC data, and some of the countries did not have existing tools to pick up that data. And uh, we needed to compare results across countries that were being supported under momentum. So we looked at uni, nearly uniform tools that would compare data across countries. And there was also a limitation in the pandemic restrictions, especially in movements, that traditional data collection methods, especially the ones that involved movement of uh, the assessors from one facility to another was not permissible. So the Solistice data collection and uh, use application is a digital tool which we used and we found it very helpful because it is open source and it, it can easily be transferred to government or local partners to manage. And we also used Solistice because of the is it is easy to use especially in uploading tools and collecting detailed ipc washed data and it also has dashboards that allow for analysis of this data which is collected at local level maybe at district level or facility level let's go to the next slide please so when phase one picked up 
we now introduced phase two and phase two we're strengthening the local partner capacity to establish and sustain an infection prevention system. So we supported what we call the virtual learning through the hub and spoke model. The hub is the bigger center with subject matter experts that trained or mentored and gave the, their expertise to the smaller health facilities whom we called SPOCs, especially through their infection uh, prevention and control teams where the facilities participated. So it was a general exchange of knowledge and maybe questions and experience from the SPOCs to the bigger hubs and the hubs were distributing including uh, materials that were being produced as guidance to the spokes in view of infection prevention so we had quality improvement training and practicum delivered by the momentum country and global leadership teams through the institute of healthcare improvement to our facilities and then we followed it up with mentorship meetings in those facilities we had uh, data reviews at facility level ipc data was collected analyzed and reviewed at both facility and district level with the district dht teams and the momentum country and global ship staff we had moderated whatsapp groups for peer learning for performance support and a Google site to host in time learning moments. Learning moments were sent through that Google site to facility staff to help them keep up the knowledge they had gained from the trainings. And for where we could not do virtual learning, we had in-person support, especially for facilities that had particular low performance and they were not able to go on with the virtual trainings. Next slide, please. So we had to all the monitoring of the phase two and the monitoring of the phase two activities, we kept the momentum country and global leadership team came up with four quality improvement aims which were shared across all our facilities and I have to go through if I'm to go through the first one we looked at the percentage of healthcare facility staff who adhered to the mask protocol. The second one, we looked at percentage of individuals who were properly screened for COVID-19 upon arrival at a facility. The third one was the percentage of staff who complied with hand hygiene protocol during interaction with patients. And the fourth aim was the percentage of the cleaning routines observed when a cleaner is cleaning a high touch surfaces like doorknobs, light switches, faucets, bed surfaces and the like so this one helped us to maintain high healthcare facility wide and wood level ipc readiness scores so these aims helped the facilities to follow on quality improvement projects which helped the facilities to maintain these high ipc readiness scores next slide please so we had uh, cross country learning questions that are highlighted here, especially how acceptable and feasible were the virtual mentorship trainings, uh, the questions through pulse surveys, key informant interviews, we had more significant change stories and looked at key indicators and lessons learned meetings. So we had these sessions in order to try and answer the learning questions that are broadcast here. Next slide, please. So we are going to show you a video from Ghana and it will highlight how Momentum has worked with the faith-based facilities to improve infection prevention and control. And after that, I'll hand you over to my colleague Sam to take you through the results. Over to you, Steve. My name is Sister Rina, the administrator of Holy Family Hospital located in Brakum, Bono region of Ghana. Over the years, Chag has been a reliable partner rallying faith-based health facilities to promote primary care, public health, preventive, promotive and curative health. But 
the pandemic presented us with a new challenge and that is how we do fulfill Christ's mandate to heal the sick in the era of COVID-19. The pandemic exposed certain gaps in our health service delivery. Some of my health workers, especially the orderlies, were not familiar with the infection prevention control standards, including hand hygiene, use of PPEs, screening and triaging, and sanitation. The Momentum Country and Global Leadership Project funded by USAID for which I worked with Chapaigo sought to develop the capacity of 25 institutions with high volume deliveries to handle infection prevention and control and also to deal with COVID and any future emergencies that may emerge. We have been able to train 100 improvement, quality improvement coaches that support entire child network with quality improvement. I know my staff, they were not familiar with the online training. So I was so happy to see them enjoying quality improvement training. We also learned how to lead people to brainstorm, change ideas, and develop action plans that we can implement to address a challenge. We constituted our own quality improvement team to improve IPC wash, especially environmental cleaning and sanitation in the hospital. Now, every client wears their face mask, wash their hands, and visits the screening area for nurses to check their vital signs before entering the hospital. Every staff can also perform the standard IPC measures like hand washing and cleaning of their workstation with alcohol. We also trained all 29 orderlies on how to prepare a chlorine solution to clean, especially commonly touched surfaces like door handles, workstations and wards, and also segregate biological and general waste. Again, all the 25 facilities were supported with light infrastructure, and these areas included water and sanitation, plumbing areas, hand hygiene installations in all the facilities. Now, I'm proud to say that with the funding from USAID, we have constructed a waste storage site at the outskirt of the hospital, close to the incinerator. The waste collection site has a separate space for general waste, which the waste collector comes for, and biological waste, which is burnt at the incinerator. We are quite happy about the results that we have achieved in infection prevention and control in the facilities. So far, 100 healthcare workers from the 25 selected facilities have been trained in quality improvement, and these are serving as quality improvement coaches to support the network. On the average, we were able to improve infection prevention readiness by about 10 percentage points in most of the units. The WASH IPC training has been very, very impactful. Now my staff are very confident that they can provide care to their clients without fear of contracting COVID-19. Thank you very much, Lillian and Steve. I think we can go back, yes. Thank you, Brian. My name is Sam Mongom. I work for Japaigo, but I was uh, supporting Momentum Country and Global Leadership Project as monitoring and evaluation advisor. Next slide, please. So I'm going to run us through the results. What came out? What were we seeing? Next slide, please. So first, we wanted to track and see our performance on basic wash or IPC. 
outline on those uh, five pillars, looking at water, sanitation, hygiene, waste management, and environmental cleaning. And you can note that environmental cleaning had the most improvement. When we look at the baseline at 13%, then end line at 65%, that was a big jump. And we know basic services is just the elementary, just the basic standard. So, but you look at environmental cleaning, we did very well. Next slide, please. Now, I want to point out when we are tracking baseline and end line, we are looking at the highest score, the lowest score, average, and medium. And we see Bangladesh started at the lowest, but made the greatest improvement. Now, when we look at uh, Ghana, Ghana started in the middle, actually the best, if you look at uh, the baseline, and then continue maintain the performance. So when we look at the average, I said, yes, we started from 50 on average score, all facilities, but at the end of it all, we were at 72 average, which was so great. Next slide, please. Now, some of the areas we were interested in looking at adherence to unwashing and PPE standards. Now, when we look at all our facilities across the countries. Now we see unwashing from 54 jump to 60. And the PPE used from 44 to 69. We said if this gains, we can only maintain. This is great movements. Next slide, please. Now the detailed results can be found in these consoles. We have all the data, all the results for Bangladesh, for Ghana, for India, Sri Leone, and for Uganda. Detailed results can be found in these consoles. Next, please. Now, while we are doing uh, data collection, we are using other methods also and try to triangulate uh, the information. Now, one of the approaches we use was most significant change. This is qualitative, where you go to the facility, sit with them, take them through, and you ask them what is their most significant change they see at their facilities. So this brought together clinicians, cleaners, all categories of staff in a facility. But you can note that Three facilities selected stories written by cleaners because while we are implementing this project, we train cleaners. So this being one of the projects, training cleaner, the, low, the, the, the lowest cadre, and then their stories was so touching. So when they wrote their stories, three facilities selected said, no, I think this is the most change, a significant change we see at our facilities. But as we implement, we know commodities, supplies is a big challenge. So those were some of the bottlenecks along the way, but you will train, they will have the knowledge, but when they don't have things to use, it poses another challenge. Lack of some basic supplies, yes, and protocols. It may be there, in the books, but now if it is not posted somewhere where they can access easily, it poses a, a, a challenge. Healthcare facility staff also saw noticeable changes following the training. Remember, like my colleague Lillian said, they were training virtually, they were physical. So after the training, they saw significant changes. IPC training included information that were very new to participants. Like now we are talking about training cleaners. In Uganda, the cleaners are recruited, 
from basic uh, qualification they have. Then they are posted to do the work. And now this is somebody who doesn't know how to mix jig for hand washing, jig for cleaning the surface. So this training was giving them very new information. Me measuring IPC practices was very useful because at facility level, we have IPC committees. So now these are the guys who would sit monthly to review their data, to look at their performance. And in those meetings, they see what to be changed, what to uh, uh, keep doing. And it was very helpful. Next slide, please. So I want to dive uh, deep into Uganda specific. This was general across the five countries. But now I want to go specifically for Uganda. Next slide, please. Now, when we go to Uganda, like Steve mentioned earlier, we had extension. So now this ex extension was also a request from Ministry of Health that yes, we have done this work. Now we've gone into collecting data using digital. Can we continue with this? So we did and supported both at uh, central level and sub-national level, which is now district and health facilities. We build their capacity on how they can collect their data, on how they can analyze their data, and how they can use their data. So this MWater, we had a consultant who supported us through MWater, that supported us through in even training building the consoles so that when the facility collects the data, it's just a click and you see your dashboard and you see the performance. Next slide, please. Now with so many boxes here, I just, I'm just going to make a summary of this, that it was a process that when we did our inline using M water at the time that restrictions of movements was uh, put in place, facilities use M water. And then when they use that, they loved it. They said, no, I think this is the way to go because each IP implementing IPC wash, they have their tool. We don't have consolidated tool by Ministry of Health. So with this request, we brought them on board. We said, okay, fine, as a project, MCGL, this is the tool we are using. What about the uh, ministry? So we match these two tools together with consultation and pre-testing, and then we build final tool that is currently being used. But this tool we pre-tested, we train at the district level focal point persons. Now these people, they are the backstop. They support the facility to analyze the data. They support the facility to have the dashboard in place. So what facility does is just to collect the data and the facilities were trained. Each of these facilities we are working in, they were trained to collect, how to collect the data using MWater. So the tool we have uh, negotiations with the Ministry of Health at the central level so that they can take it over and then they use it going forward. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, you can uh, go on uh, that website and then you get the details of our dashboard. Now the dashboard, we have one for Ministry of Health. Now this one will help ministry to look at performance of the facilities, all the facilities where we are working. And then they know how they, they, they are doing, uh, what support they need, and also on the right hand side, we have a healthcare facility. Now this is for individual facilities. When you click the drop down, you pick on your facility and you see the performance of your facility. This would help facilities see where to improve how they're performing so that they can move forward. Next slide, slide please. So this is for the facility. Like now we pick one facility and you can see it picks even the GPS. So if, if the picture was posted for the facility, all the details are picked 
And now you can see your score. The four tools we have, general IPC, you have Word, you have, so you can see the performance accordingly. Next slide, please. So when we look at our five pillar, now, like I said earlier, the basic, the basic is just minimum standard that you want to start from there and move forward. But you find there are areas where you don't even have anything and we are saying no service. So at Ministry of Health level, you are able to look at all this, how your facilities are, are performing on the sustainable development goal number six. So this helps the ministry to take decision to see how do we support these guys? What do we need to do? And they are able to look at details of specific facilities. Next slide, please. So I want to hand over to Steve to take it over from here. Steve, over to you. Uh, thanks, Sam, for the presentation. Um, I'll spend the last few minutes just going through a few of the highlighted uh, lessons learned and recommendations that apply across the five countries. But I also wanted to note that uh, on the uh, Momentum website, we're going to have technical uh, reports and supplemental resources that provide a lot more detail on lessons learned and recommendations for the specific country programs that we were working in. Next slide. Um, so one of our first recommendations is that uh, future programs should scale strategic approaches that combine this quick focus on incremental readiness improvements and then um, more substantial quality improvement support to systems and behavioral aspects of an infection prevention program. We know now from doing this type of work across many different health facilities through this project and others, that we can have really quick and significant impact on health facility infection prevention readiness. What we know less is how that readiness can be sustained after the support ends. And so through this momentum project, we're hoping to um, implement an activity where we go back to these facilities after 12 or 18 months after the support has ended to start to look at whether or not they're able to maintain these improvements and what their challenges or reasons for maintaining the improvements have been. Uh, our second recommendation is that you use a common digital data system that's accessible to all the stakeholders uh, to monitor and track these infection prevention programs and indicators. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that existing national and local data management systems, they don't have the comprehensive set of indicators that you need for a strong infection prevention program. And so we need to either create a supplemental one or we need to build out those systems to provide that type of data. And we wanna do that with the Ministry of Health's um, sanction or, um, or mandate of which system to use so that we're not introducing a variety of different tools in different districts and health facilities, but they're all going to a common platform uh, that they can all access from the central level of the Ministry of Health down to the district and to healthcare facility managers and even ward supervisors can get into the system and see the same data. Um, this next recommendation won't be a surprise to anyone, but we are recommending uh, formalizing the role of cleaning staff and strengthening their capacity uh, to do their critical role in maintaining infection prevention. This recommendation was very strong, um, uh, very strongly uh, came out through all of our country programs uh, from the stakeholders themselves. So when we did these learning methods where we interviewed or did most significant change with the healthcare facility staff, they always mentioned um, that cleaners have been neglected and that they need to be elevated and supported to do their work and uh, that they're the backbone essentially of these infection prevention programs. Uh, fourth, we wanna explore ways to connect national and local health 
or local wash systems to healthcare facilities and their networks. By this, I mean, uh, we know that even after we provide this rapid uh, readiness support, that these infrastructure and the supply systems, they need to be maintained and serviced. And we're looking for ways to connect professional service providers that are currently working on initiatives that support communities, households, or schools to also uh, connect with health facilities and these health networks to provide routine professional services and elevate uh, the sustainability of the WASH systems in these facilities. Uh, Momentum is looking at a, a new activity based on these learnings where we're exploring um, what the relationship is between health systems and WASH systems in specific countries. And we're looking forward to um, publishing some results from that, um, that um, landscape assessment once, once it's ready. And lastly, uh, we need to continue testing multimodal behavior change strategies to increase health facility uh, staff compliance with critical IPC behaviors. I think you may have seen on the behavior change results slide that, um, first of all, both the baseline and end line results for behavior compliance was somewhat low. Uh, we made some improvements in both hygiene and uh, PPE compliance in some of the countries, but even the end line results were about 50, 60% and we need them to be much higher if we want um, those practices to have an impact on reducing infections in the facility. And so we need to uh, come with uh, much more expansive and intensive behavior change strategies uh, to increase and maintain those compliance rates. Next slide. Uh, very briefly, I'll go over a few of the recommendations we have for implementing virtual support. Uh, which was sort of required during the early days of the pandemic. And um, these lessons learned uh, could be useful for a variety of uh, virtual quality improvement uh, approaches, even outside the wash and infection prevention sector. So our first two recommendations are about um, providing sort of hybrid support, virtual and in-person support to facilities. When we uh, polled healthcare facility staff and district health management teams on how the virtual quality improvement and training support went, they raised um, strong preference for continuing in-person engagement. Um, we know this wasn't possible during the early days of the pandemic when we implemented this work, but if we were to do it over, we would try to find ways to either bring them together in person intermittently so that they can connect and build relationships or to find other ways virtually where we can try to establish more rapport and make them feel more comfortable engaging. One of our pulse poll questions was about whether or not they felt comfortable asking questions and raising challenges in these virtual settings. And the majority of our participants said, no, they didn't feel comfortable. They felt better doing that in person with people that they knew and worked with closely. Um, our third recommendation here is about uh, preparing for virtual and in-person implementation. So one of the things that we thought was a benefit in our work plan was we prepared to provide this quality improvement support virtually um, when a lot of the lockdown measures were strongly in place and also to transition to in-person support when it was possible and to go back and forth as needed. And we thought that was a, a very um, useful planning mechanism we put in place. Um, and then fourth, in order to do these QI approaches, uh, we have to plan to invest in technology and equipment as much as possible. And to make sure that uh, the fifth recommendation is to make sure that the participants have a lot of time to become familiar and comfortable with these approaches and the systems used um, before we start to dive into technical content. We added some of this into our initial um, quality improvement uh, work plan but we didn't spend enough time, according to the participants, uh, giving them the tools and resources to feel comfortable engaging in the virtual environment. Next slide. Um, we have a lot of existing and upcoming resources related to this five country work plan on our website. So some of the existing resources are the essential supply list that we've already published um, and two of the country program resources for Bangladesh and Sierra Leone 
they're already on the website along with the videos that we've uh, produced from our work in Ghana. And uh, in the next few weeks, we'll be putting more documents on for the remaining three countries. And we'll also be publishing a five country wide program report on how this work plan went and the lessons learned and recommendations. Um, we're gonna make the links to these resources and the recording of the video and the slide deck from this webinar available after the webinar so that you can access them and, and come back and check for the resources we're going to put on the site. With that, um, I just wanted to acknowledge some of our partners. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to thank USAID uh, and the national and local governments for their support in implementing this work plan and connecting us to other partners who were um, working on various aspects of the COVID pandemic response and on quality improvement in these countries. Um, I wanted to thank the country teams from Momentum and our Christian Health Association partners for all the work they did to implement these work plans during a, a time of heightened fear and uncertainty and changing um, challenges within these countries and to MWater for all of the technical support they gave us to implement and monitor these programs. With that, I'll uh, open it up for questions and, and discussion. Um, Jason or Deirdre, I don't know if you would like to uh, highlight some questions and pitch them to the team for answer, if you'd like me to go through the questions myself. Jason, do you want to share um, based on your prior prioritization? Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, one Steve, um, one question, Steve, was uh, what was the criteria for selecting the, the healthcare facilities uh, throughout the levels too, so primary, secondary, and, and tertiary? Yeah, really good question. In all the countries, um, we started this work within the first six months of most countries around the world going into the pandemic lockdown. And so, um, we, there were national pandemic response um, coordination mechanisms being set up in each of these countries. So we worked with the ministries of health and those coordination mechanisms like the clusters or others to find out where everyone was working and what they were working on. And that sort of dictated where we went. We went to places where other partners weren't covering or where the ministry of health thought that the biggest risk uh, would be for their for their um, health system in the COVID response. All right, uh, we got another question here, maybe for for Lillian, if you're if you're online. Uh, we had a question: is to whom do we advocate for for country governments to prioritize and institutionalize and fund uh, Washington healthcare facilities? Is it the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Water? Uh, environment, uh, who, who do we advocate to for for continued support for, for WASH and IPC at the, at the country level? Uh, thank you uh, uh, very much for that question. I would like to give a, a highlight, especially from experience from Uganda. I would like to say that WASH is quite broad right from the Ministry of Water to Health, to education, even up to community level. I uh, will look at uh, this advocacy for continued funding for WASH that it should also cut across because um, when you look at the Ministry of Water, it has many priorities. You look at health, it has also priorities, but we're looking and saying that funding for WASH should continue to cut across these different uh, sectors, especially being that each of the sectors has specific priorities to health that might be a little different from another sector. Let's say the health sector may have uh, specific priorities, especially looking at health acquired infections that WASH would improve and may not be the very, the sector of education may not prioritize that one. So our thought is that this continued funding should still cut across the different uh, ministries of water, of health, of education, and even 
the Ministry of Health to go even to community level. That is still through the Ministry of Health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lillian. A, couple, a few more questions here. Um, uh, one, one uh, maybe Steve, you can help uh, uh, answer this one, but uh, they're asking about uh, do you, any bottlenecks or challenges. One, one somebody brought up a, a good point about how uh, hand washing in, the, in Uganda reached uh, an, up, an upper limit. Um, was, and they wanted to know if this was due to supplies or if there were other uh, uh, factors that, that were involved. And Sam, if you have any, uh, anything to note, I, I will note that, uh, that I, even though Uganda, Uganda did have the, some of the highest uh, uh, compliance rates on hand washing, which, which actually made it, uh, put it at a level that was similar to you know, the United States or Europe has, in, in regards to hand washing compliance. Thanks, Jason. Um, I can start and Sam if, or Lillian, if you have other thoughts, let me know. But I think uh, some of the pervasive challenges are that with these quick interventions, we can make significant progress and we can raise infection prevention readiness scores against this plethora of indicators to a certain threshold, like around 70, 80%. Once you get to that level, uh, there are some systems challenges that make it much more difficult to make it from 80 to 100% in terms of infection prevention readiness and behavioral compliance. And those things are like uh, the supply chain systems and how dependable um, supplies flow from national to local and health facility level and who's responsible for those. Um, some of the larger infrastructure needs at health facilities remain and financing and, um, and support for that is difficult to come by. And I think a lot of the um, data and monitoring related issues are also at play when you don't have these robust data sets um, to tell you where the infection prevention risks are and how to prioritize them makes it much more difficult to um, make and sustain progress. So some, those are some of the challenges that we think uh, will impact sustainability. That's why we're looking forward to doing this sort of like uh, post-program evaluation, hopefully next year. And we're also trying to explore how we can help solve some of these issues. The essential supply list that we published was an initial attempt to start to work on the supply chain issue by providing global guidance on, this is what should be at every health facility and every point of care. And these are some guidelines on how you can try to uh, project stocks and order supplies, but then we need to work on the more difficult part of how do we actually make sure those systems are working. Thank you, Steve. Um, another question here, maybe Sam and uh, Najima might, might be able to help answer this one. Uh, they wanted to know about the challenges uh, about implement, uh, regarding implementing this these programs at a primary uh, level versus at a secondary and tertiary level. And uh, and to go along with that, if there was any work with the with the cleaners to to empower them, or how is that work in cleaners involved at those different levels? Thank, thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Jason. Yes, in terms of empowering, yeah, let me start with um, training them, taking them, walking with them through what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to do it, and then developing protocol that they can follow, they can keep using. I think that was the first step of supporting them and empowering them. Now, when they are armed with the knowledge and knowing how to do it, that was our starting point. But hopefully we think they will continue doing that because at the district level, we have a office of assistant, a district health officer in charge of environmental. So now these are the guys when they go down to provide supportive supervision, they would check and look at how they are doing their work and the support they need. So I think that is the empowerment that the cleaners can pick and go forward with the district. 
Now, in terms of challenges, yes, we can't run away from the logistics and these uh, supplies, these consumables, always that is a big challenge like we highlighted uh, in our presentations that yes, they will have this knowledge, but when they don't have the gloves, heavy duty glove for cleaning, for example, then they are, they are the risks of getting the infection and they can't do their work properly. So that poses a lot. And now when you go to the facility, to the district, this talk out, yes, that is the biggest challenge. Over. Okay. Hi, Najima here. Um, just one thing that I would like to probably add to Sam is just that um, in the smaller PHUs, um, it was more of like a shared responsibility across uh, all the team members and including the cleaning staff. Because they're smaller um, in terms of the workers there at the facility, we saw that they were e it was easier for them to work together to ensure that they were adhering to those IPC protocols. Um, and again, like highlighting what Sam said in terms of those challenges around logistical support, you know, for the uh, district uh, IPC um, teams to go down and provide that uh, facility support that did, you know, come into play. Um, and then the stock out of those uh, consumable items. But I think in terms of comparison to the primary health units and those secondary level, the smaller teams and the smaller units were easier, it's easier to manage and, and, and really ensure that all of the workers are working together to, to adhere to those protocols versus in the secondary facility when there are larger, uh, bigger teams, um, you know, that close monitoring becomes a little bit more difficult over. Thank you, Sam and Najima. Uh, we had a couple of questions regarding the, the, the data use and the dashboards. Um, so the dashboards were developed through the project for, the, for a tool that was used uh, across the project. Uh, they are still available and the, and the facilities can use them if they'd like. However, in Uganda, we actually um, adapted the, the dashboards and the tools to, to be in line with the national tool. So in the case of Uganda, that tool is still available and, uh, and uh, it's actually, they own it now. So it's theirs to, to do with what they, what they may. Um, another question here. Uh, let's see. All right, uh, so we had some questions, maybe Sam or Najima again or Lillian. Uh, they wanted to know about, uh, talked a bit about uh, how the IPC champions and the designated facilities and, and what kind of persons they were, were they a doctor or a nurse, what was their role um, and, and how important was it for, for, the, for the program? Um, Najima here. Um, so uh, the IPC leads um, were, are, we're not actually the in charge or like the leads in the, of the facility. We find that they were really overburdened with a lot of work. And so it actually worked in our best interest that the IPC lead that they chose was actually um, a, a lower level cater of uh, staff, cater of staff, sorry. Um, and so they were able to, um, although they were the lead, they were able to bring together those, uh, the, all of the staff together to look at the protocol, setting the protocols and actually do it, um, working together to uh, strengthen, you know, the adherence to, uh, you know, PPE, uh, the PPE protocols, etc. So, um, yeah, it was not a higher level staff member who uh, who were designated these IPC leads. We found that it was actually actually appointed staff that um, maybe had less responsibilities that would be able to drive the IPC work at, within the facility. Over. Thank you. Uh, this is Lillian here. This is Lillian from Uganda. Uh, the experience we had with this, uh, uh, the focal persons for the IPC, especially here in country, those were people that were actually, whose names were brought forward by the hospital administration due to the fact that they could create more time to spearheading the team. And they also had subject matter expertise in the area of IPC. And they were brought forth, maybe looking at their previous record in the health facilities, the people who had supported 
infection prevention and control uh, projects and in that area. So for us here, it was more like the health facility administration forwarded the person and even allow allocated some a little more time knowing that this person had to attend to supporting the IPC wash committee works. Over to you. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, Steve, this might be a question for you. And uh, so, so someone was asking about the prevalence and incidence of uh, uh, nosocomial infections or, or uh, healthcare acquired infections. Uh, they, they also want to know if we had any information specifically that to black uh, fungus infections during, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, which I know was an, was an issue some places. Uh, but it, I don't know, Steve, can you speak to us about, uh, about tracking infections and the challenges associated with it? Um, yeah, I can just say that we don't really have any good data from these countries on the rates of uh, healthcare associated infections in the facilities we're working with, or even more generally, I think nationally. Um, they're very difficult to surveil. And there is a, another USAID project called MTAPS that is working to, um, to improve those surveillance systems. And we coordinated with them in a few countries where this work overlapped uh, on specific activities, but we don't have any good data. We did ask health facilities to track how many COVID infections um, they saw among their staff in the first few years of the pandemic. Um, but that data I think was a little bit unreliable um, because the staff were coming and going for a variety of reasons from the health facility. Um, workload, fear of, of coming to work, and also uh, having COVID infections. So sorry, we don't have uh, very good data there. Um, we are trying to work through this program and others like MTAPS to try to see if we can help improve those systems though. We're almost done uh, with the presentations here. Let me run through a, a few couple of quick questions and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. Uh, I'll let you know that uh, we will, the, the dashboard, links to the dashboards are available in the presentation and then that we'll also share a presentation specific on how the dashboards work and, and if, if anyone's welcome to, to see that as well. Um, uh, we do have uh, some technical briefs uh, coming up uh, that uh, that will be will be shared as well on, uh, on all the different uh, projects. Um, I know someone was asking for for access to photos and videos. Unfortunately, the the pandemic did make that very difficult to to collect uh, to collect visual visual media. We do have very good data though. Um, and I'll pass it on to Steve for for any final comments, and we'll 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 let you all get get on with your day. Uh, thanks, Jason. Thanks to everyone for joining. Um, like I said, this was sort of just a highlight presentation. We have much more detailed information and results in the country documents that will be available, which we will share. And um, we can answer any remaining questions over email. So thank you so much for joining. Hope you have a great rest of your day.